Okay, so welcome to this session of Philosophy Matters, and we're very pleased to have as our special guest tonight, Akiva Quinn. So a little about what Akiva is going to be speaking tonight on. The title is The Moral Arc Bends Towards Justice. And tonight, Akiva will discuss the case for moral progress and the advance of social justice. He'll offer reflections on historical and contemporary issues from Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement through apartheid South Africa and Black Lives Matter, post-colonialism, LGBTQI+, and First Nations recognition to ongoing conflict, gender, racial, and social inequality. Akiva will draw on examples, films and texts, such as Selma, 2014, Ken and Malik's The Quest for a Moral Compass, Michael Shermer's The Moral Arc, Stephen Pinker's Enlightenment Now, and Malcolm Gladwell's Talking to Strangers. You will be prompted tonight to consider your position given the myriad modern moral and social challenges. So the big question tonight is, does the moral arc indeed bend towards justice or not? So a little about Akiva. Akiva Quinn's passions include philosophy, an open discussion of life's many big questions. He studied philosophy and sociology at Monash University and completed an MA there in 2010. Akiva enjoys philosophy, literature, films, and shows that explore our social reality and reflect on the human condition and moral, political, or religious challenges and disputes. So with that, I'd like to welcome Akiva. Thank you so much, Les, and thank you everyone for coming along as I, uh, mentioned before in the, um, the welcome segment. It's a great pleasure to see uh, familiar faces who I've only met in this um, particular online context. So the topic is quite simply, in fact, you'll notice, I'm sure, when you signed up to attend this talk, that the, um, the topic is in the form of a statement rather than a question. So as Martin Luther King himself uh, uttered these words, and I'll offer you a little bit of history for those who know some of it, but perhaps um, would like to learn a little bit more, which you may or may not know, um, the statement is that the moral arc bends towards justice. Let's see what the case is. And then certainly during Q&A, we will consider one and all objections which you choose to raise in this forum. Okay, so what I wanted to start with is just a brief survey of what we mean by morality. I'll use the term as many writers um, within the philosophy, within moral philosophy and within ethics, including ethical theory do, which is I'll use those terms interchangeably. I'll mostly use the term moral or morality because that's the, uh, the wording of, of the statement and um, the way we're going to explore it tonight. But if I you say ethics, I don't mean anything different by it. Some speakers do. What is morality? Effectively, it's the aim to act correctly in the world. So the quest for right action, where there's some standard of what's right, something that's good, something that's right, compared to its, uh, its opposites or how we ought to love, which comes from Socrates through the entire tradition from Plato, for those who aren't aware, uh, Socrates wrote nothing. So uh, we have his words through uh, Plato's pen. So we believe that's what Socrates main fact said, but Plato wrote it. Um, moral judgments then must be backed by good reasons and morality requires impartial consideration of each individual's interests. I'll just quickly emphasize those points. So there must be reasons. If I simply say it's good to eat lots of ice cream, you can probably understand pretty quickly that that's a statement of opinion. I haven't offered any reasons at all because ice cream that's, you know, vanilla or whatever is absolutely the best. These are reasons. They are explanations. They may be interesting, but they don't demand to good reasons philosophically. Impartial consideration is absolutely crucial because in any claim, and I'll be making several of them this evening, 
about human rights, one needs to consider all actors without favor or prejudice. So one can't say the kings, the upper class, this particular caste are the ones whose consideration should be held as significant, one has to say, all people impartially. And also impartial means I can't say, well, this benefits me and I'm not concerned whether it benefits you or many other people. I have to be impartial or also known as universal about my moral judgments. Let's move on to tonight's topic, moral progress, many ways of defining it. So I'll rely on uh, Michael Shermer, at least for the moment, the moral arc. Uh, he defines moral progress as the improvement in the survival and flourishing of sentient beings. So he's broadened it beyond human beings. I won't spend a lot of time on that. It is important, but my focus will be on those particular sentient beings that we would identify as human. And it's about survival. So just getting through the day, not being killed, maimed, dismembered, or various other things and flourishing, which effectively would mean living a good life. However, that individual agent uh, or individual might regard a good life. And then how do you achieve moral progress? Let's cut to the chase. How could I defend a thesis, which I am doing this evening, that the moral arc bends towards justice? I'm doing that on the basis that reason, so appealing to good reasons we just mentioned before, and the invocation or consideration of impartial uh, measures of what's good will help us and have helped us help us as a society, as a group of societies, as a world community to move towards justice and equally expanding the circle of empathy so that it embraces what value or the, the equal value of people everywhere and their rights you know, to pursue a good life. So really it's about reason and empathy. I'm gonna state that it will become clear as we go through a few more uh, sections of the presentation that I'm gonna put my store in both aspects of what traditional students of philosophy um, as adults or as younger people, whenever you may have encountered philosophy formally or otherwise, there's sometimes a bit of a divide between the empathic and the reasoning. I'm going to suggest that both play a crucial role in understanding moral progress and how it can and, in fact, is achieved. So, on to Martin Luther King Jr. You don't need to hear too much more from me for the next minute because you can hear from the man himself. This speech, just to provide the context, many of you will know this well. Uh, in 1965, the movie Selma documents this in a very beautiful and, you know, evocative manner. Um, the protesters basically seeking um, some form of, you know, voting equality and other um, systemic inequalities in the United States of the time for um, black people um, attempted to march from Selma twice. They were thwarted by various state troopers and some pretty heavy handed local thugs, let's call them. Um, and this was their third attempt. And they finally, with the um, approval really of the, of the federal government, actually got the go ahead to do this march through mud and mire and much more for five days. And they arrived weary, no doubt, frustrated, um, but also hopeful at the Capitol in, the, in Montgomery, Alabama, having concluded that march from Selma. So here is. We shall overcome. Before the victory is won, some would be misunderstood and called bad names and dismissed as rabble rousers and agitators. But we shall overcome. And I'll tell you why. We shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We shall overcome because Carlisle is right. No lie can live forever. We shall overcome because William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth crushed to earth will rise again. We shall overcome because James Russell Lowell is right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future 
Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. We shall overcome because the Bible is right. You shall reap what you sow. We shall overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. So I don't know what's happening in the chat because I'm concentrating on trying to present in a reasonably coherent manner to you all. But I think um, that is my sentiment, and I'm going to support that sentiment um, from Martin Luther King Jr. and others um, with reasons and with evidence. And that will be my presentation. Before we move to that, just to provide you with the context, which um, the moral art, for ex example, by Michael Shermer uh, outlines very beautifully. Um, we already know that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards toward justice. He was actually referencing the word of another reverend, uh, Theodore Parker, who was a 19th century abolitionist, who also offered this very optimistic outlook. And there was nothing particularly optimistic about the times in 1965 when Martin Luther King gave that speech and neither was there about 1853 America. Um, Theodore Parker said, I do, or he wrote to be more precise, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. So that's the slightly longer version of really the same sentiment and the same thought. And I think it's quite useful because it indicates that it's not inevitable and that you can't see it in an obvious way, but that conscience is involved. And I will talk shortly about values and we have already introduced what morality is, at least at outline level. And that would really be my claim. We're not only or particularly talking about social progress, although that's part of our topic. We're also talking about moral progress, which I would define in a sense as the realization among sufficient portions of the global community uh, of what is right, of how we should live and how we should let others live. So the conscience and the two reverence, you know, invocations of higher purpose is in fact relevant to understanding the topic in my view. Criteria for moral progress then. Uh, we have a picture there of David Hume, Scottish uh, philosopher from the 18th century. We'll get to his words in a minute. I've suggested by way of outline, that for moral progress to be possible, it involves an acceptance to some extent, at least, if not to a full extent, of the moral equality of all human beings, concern for others, and protecting the rights or interests of people everywhere through a range of actions and laws at the local level, the national level, and the international level. So some of you will have noted conversation in the uh, meetup event regarding the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and we will be getting there very soon. And that's part of the context is that there are certain instruments, including uh, legally and legally binding covenants, um, which are part of national law, although formulated at the international level, which are crucial to uh, achieving moral progress. A little bit of background in at least one of the positions in um, the major streams of philosophy. This is going to be the empirical position. Let me just read what David Hume wrote in this regard. It is not contrary to reason to prefer the destruction of the whole world to the scratching of my finger. It is not contrary to reason for me to choose my total ruin to prevent the least uneasiness of an Indian or person wholly unknown to me. All I want to get from that at the moment is that reason does not settle the matter. You can 
decide based on reason. You would rather thousands of people in a distant context suffer. In fact, he said they're the destruction of the whole world. So that's a whole lot stronger than that, rather than you suffering the slightest bit of pain. This suggests to me um, that there's a crucial role for empathy as well as reason, not minimizing reason, but we cannot exclude empathy. Um, in a similar vein, they were contemporaries, they knew each other, they were friends, I gather. Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiments, an equally famous passage, I've only got a little bit of it, so I don't want to take too much time on quite long stories. How would a man of humanity in Europe respond to a major calamity like a devastating earthquake affecting people far away compared to his own discomfort? So the idea is, and he goes on to say, you would feel remorse, you would feel some empathy, but you would still sleep perfectly well that night compared to, you know, if you lost a finger, which is a pretty severe injury, you know, you would not sleep well. So this is getting at whether impartiality may in fact be a really important consideration, because if it's only your own scratching of a finger or your own pain that's a consideration, then I think it's fairly hard to consider the universal and advance moral progress. Not that you shouldn't be interested in self, but you shouldn't only be interested in self. Um, I'll take it that some of this material is reasonably familiar uh, to people. There's a lot one could say about international law. I'm gonna say just a few things fairly briefly to keep us moving along. Um, let me explain at least an understanding of human rights. There are a lot of ways of justifying human rights. My preferred way is that they are effectively high priority moral claims. You have all sorts of moral claims to, you know, have pleasures in your life, to be able to pursue happiness, all sorts of things, and consequentialists among others, and I'm not at all averse to consequentialist reasoning, um, will, advance those sorts of claims. There's some things, however, such as not being dismembered, not being killed, not being in a social situation where you are being starved or where you cannot access the basics to live, including food, water, clean air, and the rest. Those are high priority moral claims. And the sentence goes on to say, they correspond to duties for others. So if as a child, for example, you've got a high priority moral claim, a right, not to be neglected, abused, and that includes being starved and various other um, horrible things, we would all agree, surely. Um, the only way that those rights, particularly for a child, and there's a you know, children's rights convention, which is part of this international law um, uh, set of treaties and agreements, the only way that that right can be given effect is for others, your parents, or if your parents fail in that obligation, those duties, the state to intervene and protect your basic freedoms and provide for your vital human needs. So that's an example taken from children's rights, but the same thing applies to any individual who may face persecution, torture, or simply not have the means despite their best efforts to feed themselves and so on. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights then, again, I'm gonna assume most of you are familiar with this. There was a period of two years led by Eleanor Roosevelt, who is uh, pictured there, of negotiations after the, uh, the tragedy and more and the human loss uh, of the Second World War, um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was agreed and was adopted by the UN General Assembly in December of 1948. A pretty swift response as global collaborative efforts go to the events of the Second World War. It reflects the United uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a universal recognition that basic rights and fundamental freedoms are inherent to all human beings, inalienable and equally applicable to everyone. 
and that every one of us is born free and equal in dignity and rights. So that's from, you know, the UN material as to explaining what the UH, UDHR is. And I've just added that this led to a body of legally binding international human rights treaties, includes the Children's Rights Convention, includes the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Economic Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights itself, uh, which amounts to an international bill of human rights. So there's a lot of other treaties, but that's probably enough to establish that there's a wide ranging set of international law um, instruments that are then ratified, I believe, in the case of the ones listed there by almost all countries on earth, and therefore have effect in national law as well as having a standing in international law. Let us, with that context in mind, try to advance the claim, which is my thesis this evening and for some decades that I've been considering these matters, that moral progress has been achieved, not uniformly as I will emphasize later, but it has been achieved, for instance, in the abolitionist movement to abolish uh, slavery, civil rights, which we touched on before in the American context, right around, right across Europe and many countries in the world, uh, the advance of women's rights, gay rights, indigenous rights, among many others. So effectively, a whole range of social movements have advocated and in practice, in reality, it's measurable, achieved significant moral progress for a whole range of individuals and groups. So effectively, by all means, ask questions and offer your view. I'm looking forward to hearing them in a little while. But that's my claim. Those are the foundations, really, for moral progress being a reality and the moral arc of the universe bending through our own efforts uh, towards justice. So that's a range of social justice movements, broadly termed which have achieved, in my view, moral progress and demonstrably so. Uh, a little bit more detail, there is improved gender equity. We could obviously spend their entire evening throwing data at each other, catching it, throwing it back, et cetera. But in general terms, from the material I've read, uh, women are compared to 50, 100 years ago, pick your time frame, uh, better educated, earn more, have greater power and influence, various countries around the world have had, you know, their um, uh, prime minister and various other roles performed by women, not every country clearly, um, but there's a significant change from the picture, let's say, 100 years ago. Life expectancies have increased. Um, there's more children involved in early childhood education, but, and I've changed colours here deliberately, in this country, in Australia, uh, there are in fact rising rates of incarceration for indigenous people. There's something here for those who live in Australia will be well aware called Closing the Gap. And those reports, which I think are done annually, indicate movements in a positive direction in many cases, but indicate what I've highlighted there, perhaps among a few other data points and very significant ones um, where there is not uniformly moral progress. I'll say that a few times, I'm not claiming in each and every case, in every time and place, there is moral progress. Such a claim would be ridiculous and indefensible, and it's not the one that I'm advancing. And in the US, many people will know this if they're fans of, you know, popular fiction, nonfiction, I should say, or uh, films such as 12 Years a Slave, um, a whole range of things where the Incarceration rates for people of color, it's not that they're rising. I actually found some data thanks to the Pew Research Center, which indicates that they, the rates of people of color, black um, and Hispanic people in America is actually slightly on the decline, but there is no question that the rates for people of color of incarceration compared to the white population is just way higher. Um, poverty has declined worldwide, 
homicide rates are markedly lower. If you go back some hundreds of years, you get 100 people in 100,000 um, who were being murdered. And now it's something like one in 100,000. Uh, every death is a tragedy, I would suggest, um, but that's a whole lot less tragedy than the 100. Uh, death penalty torture has been outlawed in most countries. There's falling global rates of violent crime. Of course, we can find examples where that's not the case, but overall, that's the data advanced by the various sources I will cite later. I'll do this fairly quickly. This is effectively the, um, the inverse picture. You want more human flourishing. That was effectively our uh, definition at the outset as to what uh, moral progress would actually look like or does look like. Uh, this is about reductions in the social harms that are experienced by individuals and groups. So if you're increasing flourishing and you're reducing harms, then you're heading in the right direction overall in aggregate over time for most societies on earth. Um, the history is pretty clear, we all know, and it's only a few hundred years, so it does depend, you know, uh, the two reverends we quoted before, they were taking a long-term view, and I am as well. Uh, slavery was practiced in the UK, you know, for some hundreds of years up until a couple of hundred years ago in the US, in those centuries, 17th to 19th, and in Australia, the Northern Territory, at least of this country, until the previous century, which may be a bit surprising, alarming, but that's the reality. A whole lot of things which were legalized and sanctioned by the state, including racial discrimination in the United States, because a lot of us are pretty familiar with that um, polis, but equally in South Africa, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, we've spoken about slavery, forced sterilization, homosexuality as a criminal offense, uh, legal bans on same-sex marriage. Um, these and more were removed from the statute books uh, in the previous century and the current century in most countries. I think in terms of slavery, probably in all countries. So there's significant moral progress. Of course, one can and should deal with the detail as to where it hasn't been achieved because that matters. But I think the overall thesis is defensible in rational and empirical terms that there is moral progress over this sort of time frame. Let's talk about South Africa. I happen to hail from the country. I haven't lived there for uh, several decades, so I don't claim to be an insider any longer. But um, just to offer you a snapshot, this starting point uh, is highlighting we have now begun our descent, which is a book, and there were many that year. There are reasons for it in around 2015, which basically said, how do we stop South Africa losing its way? Or in a similar context, if you can see what I'm holding up, um, how much longer will South Africa survive? So there's quite a few, how long will South Africa survive? Uh, Justice Malala, he writes, in many ways, this book is not about the politicians who are turning the ANC and Nelson Mandela's legacy into a nightmare. It is about all of us, South Africans, who keep quiet when our voices are needed. So from the Rainbow Nation image, and there's um, um, Madiba, Nelson Mandela on the left, the second president of South Africa who succeeded him, uh, Tabu Mbeki next to him, and the Rainbow Nation in the left image is from 2010, I would say. It looks significantly like a World Cup celebration with the Bubazellas and flags, lots of noise there, as well as all the color. And on the right is one example of people quite casually looting in July of this year, lockdowns in South Africa, severe levels of you know, COVID pandemic impacts on the community as a whole, and the commentary is effectively, it's a lot more to do with you know, poverty and inequality rather than specifically you know, lawlessness. So it may look a bit stark, those two images, 
but I'll continue and, and suggest that there is a question around moral progress in South Africa, but there's perhaps a, a useful story as to, you know, it's being a defensible claim that he, in South Africa's case as well, there is moral progress. So we've read what Justice Malala said, uh, Johnson, who I was mentioning just before, how long will South Africa survive? South Africa can either choose to have an ANC government or it can have a modern industrial economy. It cannot have both. I wanted to tie that into something that Malala actually goes on to say, which is the ANC corrupt government is what needs to stop. And that was under Jacob Zuma, who is uh, uh, pictured um, in the middle at the bottom on the right of the screen. Um, nine years of graft, state capture, as it's called, effectively a kleptocracy, basically the government stealing from the people, is clearly not conducive to assent and progress. And if one you know, illegitimate government is replaced by another corrupt government, then you know, you left trying to weigh up which was or is worse. However, the history of South Africa, as most everyone seems to know, is in 1948, the apartheid era began with the election of the National Party. Um, parallel to the existence of that regime, which was white rule, minority rule in South Africa, the Freedom Charter, about 3,000 3, uh, signatories in Clifton, which is a suburb of Johannesburg, put together a vision for a united non-racial democratic South Africa. And in fact, what is that? 40 years later, it came to pass. So that's actually quite a short time frame, and people may not always appreciate it, even as a uh, ex-South African or global South African myself, I sometimes forget that, yes, there wasn't complete representation prior to the apartheid era, but apartheid as a lie, as a injustice, actually didn't survive for so very, very long. And let's hope that the future in South Africa, you know, is a long and prosperous one for all of its inhabitants. So in 1995, immediately after the African National Congress was elected to government in South Africa, uh, under um, Bishop Desmond Tutu and others. The Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission was set up. They looked at restorative judge, uh, justice, restorative justice. They looked at some um, compensation, basically, and they looked at healing what, you know, the leaders of the nation, including Nelson Mandela, understood were significant hurts and wrongs and rifts within society. Um, Jacob Zuma, after a short um, period with uh, Motlante, who um, was president for less than a year after Thabo Mbeki's nine years, um, Nelson Mandela was president for about five years. So there was a long period of relative stability where the Rainbow Nation uh, tag made some sense and was widely used. Uh, Zuma's period, I won't say more about in this context. You've heard what I said before. And then three years ago, on my birthday, actually, mid-February of 2018, Cyril Ramaphosa was elected president. Long history in trade unions, long history as deputy um, president of the African National Congress and of the country. And he was always, from Mandela's own words, I believe, Mandela's heir apparent. So not to say it's all rosy, not to say he doesn't face major factions and no one's perfect. Um, he's got a job on his hand and the uh, challenges in the world right now are enormous to say the least. Um, but I think overall moral progress, yes, with blemishes, absolutely. I'll say a few things fairly briefly about Australia but most who've grown up in this country will know this and much more about our country for those who live here. Overseas people probably follow Australia closely enough to, to know most of this as well. So no vote for Indigenous Australians, which you would have said was a major oversight. 
and a, a major moral lack in this nation until May of 1967. But it was emphatically corrected in the sense that the referendum, which was binding, supporting equality for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, peoples, um, recorded the highest ever you know, positive votes in this country, a record 93% of the votes in favour of removing you know, the uh, exclusive vote. So pretty positive, I would have thought, a clear indication of moral progress. Um, for those who like sport, Nicky Winmar, that image is suitably famous from 1993, showing I'm black and I'm proud, um, basically when he was racially vilified at one of the major uh, football grounds or footy grounds here in Melbourne. Uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, Labour Prime Minister, in 2008, he made a formal apology to Australia's Indigenous people, uh, including in particular the Stolen Generations. And you can read the rest on the screen there. Their lives had been blighted by past government policies of forced child removal and Indigenous assimilation. So significant, major, indefensible, I would have said, with the benefit of you know hindsight. And we, we all have that now, perhaps. Um, moral injustices, but they were in some measure corrected or addressed. Marriage equality, as with many countries in the world, became law in Australia in December of 2017. I think it's pretty hard to talk about um, moral progress in the context of, you know, the modern world without particularly post 9-11, looking at the global war of, on terror and some of its consequences. I'm focusing for obvious reasons, given the final withdrawal of US and all foreign troops from Afghanistan this very evening um, from Kabul on Afghanistan. But let me just say that the comments here will apply in my view equally to um, Iraq, uh, to Syria and countries which at this point look like they've got a very painful path forward if, if, a health, if a helpful one at all, and partly as a co consequence of um, foreign adventures, let's say, or uh, wars of intervention, where it's not at all clear in terms of international law and hence in terms of moral considerations that the aims were strictly humanitarian or strictly defensive, which are effectively the two grounds for waging a just war. So I've said some of what's on the uh, slide already. Let me just quote, and I will publicly state I have never done so before with positive, clear affirmation, but the words of one uh, Russian president, Vladimir Putin, who said just in the past week that foreign values cannot be imposed by force. And with respect to Afghanistan, those are students of history, would accept that he knows of what he speaks because the loss of Afghani lives and Russian lives are in the hundreds of thousands based on the conflict that Russia was engaged in up until the, the 80s, was it more or less? So Putin said, any such socio-political experiments have never been crowned with success. And on the contrary, They've led to the destruction of states and the degradation of their political and social systems. So really, it's a cautionary tale in colonial overreach, whether it is Russian or American. It's not about being anti-West or anything else like that. You cannot force democracy on regions where the culture, the religion are so very different. Just for a bit of fun, he was obviously having a go, and those who know this particular Chinese foreign affairs spokesman will be unsurprised by yet another little line he came out with to have a dig at America and any Western powers, including Australia, who try to do anything in the uh, foreign affairs realm. He said, democracy is not like Coca-Cola, a syrup that can be distributed around the world. So I'll just let that statement rest. And we'll move on. There are literally a hundred graphs that very easily could be presented in this context. And if you look at the reference, which I'll offer shortly 
to um, Steven Pinker in particular, Enlightenment Now. He has, I don't know how many, probably at least 100 graphs, which generally show the trend line in the direction that you would want it to be. If it's about social harms and violence and war and casualties and battle, which is what this graph is, it tends to it generally trends down. If it's about flourishing measures and people's well-being, it generally trends up women's education, children's opportunities, and so on. Okay. This graph, I was going to provide an adult content warning at the outset, but I think it's fairly evident we're going to talk about people dying in brutal manners in warfare and so on in this sort of topic. The numbers are horrifying, but how much more horrifying is half a million people dying on average in some of the years in the late 1940s, and that's after the annihilation and genocide and brutality of the Second World War, which is the most devastating and destructive global conflict ever in recorded human history, and presumably even in unrecorded human history, but who knows. Clearly, it's just the worst thing that's ever happened, you know, on planet Earth. And you look at the 1970s, and there are interesting data points there, and I'm not enough of an expert in all of the history. We could kind of annotate a few of those data points. You can see some of them are wars in the Middle East. I think that's the Iran-Iraq war, among others, in the 80s. And we still have the 200,000, you know, battle to fatalities. That's not even civilians. That's not, you know, collateral or whatever else from, you know, famine and all the rest of it. And in 2016, you know, at least those numbers are better. Better from a pretty low and unfortunate base or very high and unfortunate base, but nevertheless. Okay. Um, this is the last sort of substantive point I want to make before concluding. Um, I've already said, I've emphasized, I hope it's clear, I'm not suggesting that moral progress is uniform. I'm not saying it happens everywhere and at every time. Um, and I am emphasizing, as Martin Luther King and the other reverend uh, Parkas uh, said, it relies on our personal commitments and our political action based on our values to actually continue to achieve moral progress. Um, there are plenty of examples of moral failures. I've listed a few there in terms of where they um, stem from due to abiding self-interest, which is part of the human condition, racism, sexism, homophobia, fanaticism of a religious, you know, sort of a supernatural or spiritual kind of aspect or an ideological. Um, we know about Pol Pot and we know about killing fields. You don't have to be a religious fanatic. Just being a fanatic of whatever sort is a problem. A quick example from uh, Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell, I'll reference in a minute. Um, well known, I think, at least in US uh, circles and those of us who follow US politics, um, the notion of a traffic stop, where really the, the stopping of someone for not indicating when they change a lane, or having a faulty brake light is really a pretense. And what you're trying to do is find people with guns or people who might have, you know, criminal intention or in being engaged at that moment in criminal conduct, but you need a reason for basically to stop and search. So in Kansas City in the 1970s, they tried to do this sort of targeted policing. It failed for reasons that Gladwell goes into. I won't right now. And in the 1990s, they did it again. They focused on what's called coupling. They looked at where crime was happening. And there they put the extra patrols and not even huge numbers of officers or cars. And they were actually successful. That was adopted. I'm not a US criminologist, so by all means, question this and offer your own interpretation. But from what I've read, it was adopted nationally. And the misfortune that flows from that is legion. Uh, there are now 55,000 roughly uh, traffic stops a day, 20 million of them a year. And one example, you may or may not know the story of Sandra Bland, 
Um, spoiler alert, Malcolm Gladwell deals with that particular case in great detail in his book. Uh, she had transferred from whatever her home state was to take a job at a university in Prairie View in Texas. She literally was leaving her work that afternoon. She was pulled over for not indicating on changing lanes. There's a bit more to that story as well. I can tell you afterwards if you like. And she was arrested because she became agitated given her engagement with the police officer and she took her own life days later in jail. So that's what I would call an indirect harm, but a very clear demonstrable harm from a particular form of not being empathic or able to talk to others. Um, and direct harms, of course, will spring to mind with many events in the last few years, including what gave rise to the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the killing of George Floyd. So there's a lot more to say about that, but again, I'm assuming we're reasonably up to speed on that, many of us, and that's just putting it in a philosophical context, perhaps, as to moral progress on the one hand and acknowledging moral failures within not just individuals, crucially. Malcolm Gladwell is a very good sociologist, among other things, and he's saying these are societal problems. We collectively fail to understand or sufficiently empathize with the other. In conclusion, you've heard me say this before, it's about survival and flourishing of sentient beings. And I, and I suggest that what I've offered, waiting for your responses, is evidence over a period of decades and indeed centuries uh, that by and large, there are improvements on those metrics, hence, the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. No guarantees, however, of moral progress to continue in any, any given time or place. It's up to us individually, collectively, communities, social groups, the political engagement process, being humanists or being altruists or whatever else you might regard yourself as, as in terms of a values-oriented person, wherever your values stem from, you know, devout faith, religion, wherever your values come from, it's our journey to continue together. Moral progress, in conclusion, depends on key humane values, such as empathy, expanding the circle of empathy beyond friends, family, people you know, to the general other, to the unknown, far, far away, uh, social inclusion, diversity, and promoting the worth of all people in the global community are, I think, the, uh, the underpinnings of moral progress. I'll just finish with a historical note, um, contested in terms of its exact um, facticity, so to speak, in, in terms of the historical context, but there's a notion of the axial age. It dates from about the 8th century to the third century before the common era. And basically it's about religions, which is mostly how the world, how people in the world saw the cosmos at that point in time, basically move from logos, sorry, move from mythos, which is like mythology uh, to logos, which is really based on reason. And um, one of the books I'm about to reference refers to the quest for a moral compass and suggests that that's part of the, of the journey. We can talk about you know, Homer and we can talk about some of those um, ancient uh, you know, uh, texts and how they saw morality, but the axial age is really a transition from the hero being Achilles, who was flawed in so many ways and brutal in ways which we wouldn't countenance today if you've ever read or seen performed the rage of Achilles and such, you know, extracts from, uh, uh, from Homer, you would recognize that, you know, Renaissance man or woman, modern man or woman is very different in character to some of those ancients. Um, the references, the slides will be available, so I won't uh, talk them through. I've mentioned a few of them. Uh, Keenan Malik, who's, who we were just talking about, The Quest for a Moral Compass, that would probably be my most recommended from this reading list. 
Uh, Talking to Strangers is a fabulous read uh, by Malcolm Gladwell, as is almost everything else that he's written as well. Pinker is suitably famous, Enlightenment Now and the Angels of Our Better Nature, um, and probably a, a sort of box set, as it were, with Mr. Pinker or Dr. Professor Pinker would be Michael Shermer, The Moral Art, which is a very engaging read as well. In conclusion, if you like to watch things, I'll post the link or you can access it yourself from, uh, from the uh, PowerPoint once uh, Les shares that. Um, Stephen Pinker, who we were just talking about, and uh, she's a philosopher, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, are having a discussion in which she persuades him that um, empathy and reason both have a, a key role so that you can't just deal with empathy, it's got to deal with reason as well. Thank you so much for your patience. I hope it's been entertaining and uh, substantive and has at least engaged you in answering the question which we posed tonight for yourself. Thank you very much, Akiva Quinn, for a very thought-provoking talk tonight. Now, again, if you'd like to access uh, Akiva's PowerPoint slides and later possibly the video of Akiva's talk, then please go to the rationalrealm.com website and go to the philosophy resources section. And to keep abreast of the next talk coming up, next talks coming up, please go to the Philosophy Matters meetup group and look in the events section or to the Philosophy Matters Melbourne Facebook group. Um, So I do look forward to seeing you all uh, for our next session.